Good evening. Good evening, folks. Good evening. My name is J.P. Morris. I'm the city's project manager for the Main Street Bridge Replacement Project. I want to welcome you out tonight to our second of two community information meetings. Uh, first, I want to start off by thanking uh, White Rock Baptist Church for being so gracious to allow us to use their facility tonight. We wanted to have our meetings in the communities that are impacted by our projects, and this is really convenient. So thank you very much. Tonight, what I want to do is give you a, uh, a high-level overview of our project, uh, talk about our budgets and schedules and some of the players that are currently involved and what the bridge is going to look like and the impacts to the community while we're building it. So I'm going to start with some introductions. We'll go through the agenda here first. I'm going to introduce the uh, folks that are helping us talk about the project, talk about the schedule. We're going to talk about some questions that are typically asked with um, public works projects. Um, talk about how we're going to keep you informed during the construction phase between now and then and during construction. Um, my contact information is in the printed copy of the presentation you have with you. Feel free to take notes on that. We would like to, for you to take that home with you and share it with your neighbors. And at the end of my presentation, I'll open the floor up to any questions about this project, answer them best I can, and any I can't, um, we'll have a one-on-one -on -one so I can get your contact information and get back in touch with you. So as far as the project team goes, I've been given the responsibility of delivering this project as a project manager. With me tonight, I have um, Sheree Taylor. She's our construction manager. Um, she and a, a talented group of folks take these projects once we advertise them and award them to the contractors. Once we go to construction, in other words, they are eyes and ears in the field. Um, her coworker, Ed Wood, will be the primary construction coordinator on this project in the field. Um, to get the work done, we have to hire consultant engineers, and the designer that's with us tonight from Schwartz & Associates is Randy Saunders in the back, blue shirt and sport coat. Um, he'll help me with any technical aspects of the questions we have tonight. He and a, a whole team of folks at their office over on Timberlake Road are working hard to put together the construction drawings and the instructions that tell the contractors this is what we want you to build. This is the material we want you to use. This is how to build it. Um, the one entity that's not in the room tonight is a contractor. This is a public project, so the process that we procure those services through is what we call design, bid, and build. We're deeply immersed in the design process, the engineering process right now. Later on this year, we'll talk about the schedule tonight later on, but later on this year, we'll release these design drawings to the public for qualified contractors to give us a price, award that contract. And then when we come back to a public meeting um, in October, that contractor will be here with us to tell you how he's going to build the project. And finally, to talk about the project and uh, hopefully avoid any scares, this not-so-attractive picture was put up there to show you what you're going to see during construction, but not after construction. Um, Sheree, would you go back one slide, please? This is a little history of the bridge we're replacing down here on Main Street over the expressway. The bridge picture on the top is a picture from around 1952 to 54. We know the bridge was opened and put in service, put traffic on it in 1954. So here you see the bridge being built. and uh, Below the bridge, along the expressway, you see those crib wall retaining walls. The bottom picture is a, a more recent picture, of course, of what we see today with the bridge that's in service and the roadway signs. Go forward, please. So this, this wall is what we call a soil nail wall. Those are anchors that are drilled back into the earth, those uh, which look like bolts and washers next to the workers there. That's concrete over steel. You're going to see that during construction. Later on in this presentation and at the end of your printed pamphlet, you'll see a much more attractive facade. We put a structural element, a, structure, a wall, on the front of this that is both attractive and structural that holds the earth back as well. It's a two-stage construction process. So when you see this driving down the expressway, don't be alarmed that it's not going to look attractive when we're done. Next, please. Uh, 
the Main Street Bridge project, as I mentioned, is Main Street over the Lynchburg Expressway. Two focus areas that we wanted to address. Last week we met in City Hall and talked to typically the business community of the Central Business District in downtown. Tonight we've come over to this neighborhood, White Rock Hill. We know this project affects you differently and uh, we want to talk to you and hear what you can share with us about that and share what we're doing to hopefully help with those impacts. So, I want to talk a little bit about the, the big picture of the project, why we were placing the bridge. As I mentioned, it was put in service in 1954, uh, which is a, a phenomenal life cycle for a bridge to be there as long as it has. Our, uh, one of the big issues we have with the structure, the distance between the bottom of those steel beams on the bridge and the pavement surface that the vehicles travel on Route 29 is too narrow. We know that tractor trailers going under it that shouldn't go under it have hit it on multiple occasions. Those steel beams have been bent out of place and then bent back in place and repaired multiple times over its history. So there's some, some, some stress on those beams, um, damage that's been repaired over the years. And because of that's one reason it needs to be replaced to increase that clearance. Also, if you think about what happens every winter, we put salt on top of the bridge, plow the snow off, but what we don't think about is the salt that sprays up from the bottom as well. You'd be amazed at the amount of salt spray that comes off the expressway and also um, infil attaches to the bottom of our bridges. So you have salt damage coming from two directions and just over the life cycle of traffic pounding on a bridge going across it, um, it only lasts so long. So because it's at the end of its functional life, it's a better investment to put the money into replacing it now as opposed to the increasing cost of maintaining it and doing re rehabilitative work to it every so many years. Speaking of the cost of work, um, a preliminary estimate where we stand today, I've got three specific numbers for you here. We've been working, talking about earlier this evening, the design engineering that's ongoing right now. That engineering work is a little over $900,000 worth of work. Now once we hire a contractor to build a bridge, the engineering doesn't stop. We have to have engineers and technicians to verify that the materials and the methods and the procedures the contractors are using are what we're expecting. They ensure that the concrete's put in place correctly and it's the right concrete. The steel used in the concrete or the steel used in the girders is provided from the right sources, made, made to the right specification and the right strength. They make sure the public investment is returned in a quality product. So during, this, during that construction phase, we'll be paying um, around $870,000 worth of um, engineering inspections work. Um, and that team will include the folks from Schwartz and Associates along with um, Cherie's people. Now the cost of what we're going to pay the contractor to actually build the bridge and the road improvements with it and repair the re rebuild the retaining walls around it is approaching uh, a little over $7.8 million. Some of the, the benefits that come with this project, we mentioned earlier, we're going to increase the distance from the, from the expressway travel surface to the bottom of those steel beams on the new bridge. We're going to improve the acceleration and deceleration lanes. If you are headed northbound on 29 and you want to come up on Main Street to go downtown, or if you are headed out Main Street and want to take the loop around under the bridge to go across the river, right now you don't have acceleration lanes or deceleration lanes. So when we remove the entire bridge, we're going to lengthen the bridge, therefore widen Route 29 and connect those two loops and that will give acceleration and deceleration lanes for folks getting on and off of Route 29 business. We know that there is a significant amount of pedestrian use on the bridge and that's one of our concerns we'll talk about during construction later in the presentation. When we replace the bridge, the number of travel lanes for vehicles and the sidewalk widths will remain the same as they are to accommodate that pedestrian use. Additionally to the, to the function of the bridge, separating two roads, 
this location acts as a gateway to downtown and one of a few gateways to the city as a whole. Uh, it's important that the, uh, the project do what it can to make it a, an attractive and enhanced appearance as you come into the city or you come to downtown. Um, later in your slides and on the boards in the back of the room are renderings of what we envision the bridge will look like. We, we have some downtown revitalization going on through the waterline. Uh, improvement projects on the far ends of Main Street and Church Street currently. And this project aesthetically coordinates with that project. We're using the same street lights and some of the same appearance themes. So when all that work is done over the next few years, uh, everything will tie together visually from one end of Main Street to the other. And finally, we will be um, landscaping the quadrants that are on the, the south side of the bridge currently. You've probably seen us working out there with AEP <coughs> over the past few weeks. It's a balancing act between preserving the mature vegetation that's there and getting the work done. So once AEP is finished uh, and the con contractors on board, one of the last things you'll see done with this project will be um, replacing and improving the landscaping that may have been damaged during construction. <coughs> Bridge replacement projects can be very simple to very complicated. This one lends towards more complicated at times. When we look at replacing a bridge, we look at doing it in two methods. Taking a complete bridge out all at once, like we did on Kemper Street, or doing one side first and then the second side. You may be familiar with a bridge replacement that you drive up to that has a temporary signal on each end of the bridge, and the contractor has come through and cut, demolished the left side, and you drive on the right one way. So early in the engineering phase of this project, the city and its consultants took a hard look at, at the physical constraints of the project, at the financial constraints, at how you demolish, how you lengthen the bridge and wind the expressway. What we came up with to minimize the time that we're disrupting or impacting this bridge and to save money both is determined that it was more efficient to replace the bridge all at once, like Kemper Street. So by d making that choice, we can, we can save eight months. This will be about a 12-month construction project as opposed to 20 months. And that's important from a community impact standpoint. The, sh the quicker uh, we get in, get the work done, and get out, we feel it's better to do as much work, all the work we can in one project, and minimize that duration and try to minimize the duration of that impact to the community as well. On the cost savings side, because of the complexities that would come with doing a two-phase demolition, two-phase reconstruction, and the extra engineering over those eight months, uh, we feel like we can save $1.4 million by doing this project all at once. And during the course of that time, with the bridge removed, there are going to be some significant detours in place. And I have boards that I can um, stand next to and talk to you one-on-one -on -one afterwards more effectively. Um, but I do want to share with you our big picture of how we're going, what's going to be open and what's going to be closed. To come to this neighborhood, if you're coming from Oddfellows Road, if you're coming from Kemper Street down the expressway, and you want to take the, the ramp and come up on Main Street like you do now, that will remain in place. The, uh, there may be some work on the right-hand side of that ramp at times, but that ramp is going to stay open. To leave this neighborhood and go to Madison Heights, that loop will be the same. What we have to work with you on and, and provide the detour maps um, is to get from this neighborhood to downtown. Um, you can take Florida Avenue up to Grace Street and Grace Street to 12th will be one of the detours available. Or once you get to Grace Street, uh, you could take, um, well, excuse me. Instead of going to Gray Street, you could take the expressway to 210 and come back down the expressway. Um, it's a matter of what you're comfortable driving in the neighborhoods or on the expressway, what you feel is quicker for you. The folks that need to get to this neighborhood from downtown, for instance, they can take the expressway up to Gray Street. And once they get to Grace, they have the choice to take Grace to Florida Avenue or bring the expressway back down to Main Street. Um, 
traffic that needs to get downtown will still have access to the loop off of southbound uh, 29 business to go up to Main Street stoplight and take Main Street on into downtown. Um, any folks outside of this neighborhood looking at how folks get downtown, our primary detour route for folks coming from Oddfellows direction, headed northbound on 29, we're going to send them down Kemper Street and take a ride on 12th Street to take 12th to Main. Um, as, a, as a secondary to that, we'll also have a sign between Kemper Street and Gray Street that makes people aware that Gray Street is an alternate route to get downtown. All right. As I said earlier, go back a minute, please. You're good. One of the, one of the, the real concerns for us as a city and a project team is the amount of folks that use the bridge to walk across it, pedestrian access to downtown. And we, we've seen that, we've observed that when we've been out on the project, we know we need to, to work on that. And we're currently working with GLTC to see what solutions we can come up with for that 12 months we're building this project. We know the 1A and the 1B routes are in place to, uh, to provide that connectivity currently but with the bridge out, we think there's a need that may need to be addressed. And as that, as that plan comes together with GLTC, we'll roll out more details and communicate that to, to the neighborhood as what the service area is and how we might be able to work with the neighborhood and GLTC to, um, to help those folks out. I, it wouldn't be fair to, I'm not to a point where I have real details to share on that now other than we know there's a need and we're working on it. And finally, um, a concern more from the business community on, on the downtown side, but we acknowledge it if impacts the entire city is the coordination between this construction project and a, a multitude of other projects around Lynchburg, specifically the utility work on the far ends of Main Street and Church Street. The way things are going right now, it looks pretty good. Our intent as a city is for that project, the utility and streetscaping, to be open to traffic and the pavement in place and most of the equipment gone by the time we get this project under contract and before we start work out here. Now that project may have some signs to put in, it may have some landscaping to put in, but that's minor. As long as you have both lanes open to traffic and the center lines, the dash lines down the center of Main Street and Church Street, that alleviates the congestion on that end of, of the city. Looking at schedules, last week you may have seen a lot of activity out there. AEP has to do some relocation work so our contractor can, has room to build the bridge. They can't put a crane in the air with those electric lines that close. Um, so mm -hmm. what they've done, they've put two concrete foundations in the ground for permanent poles. And what you'll see in the next month or so, the, po the overhead electric lines will temporarily be routed around the project in a U-shape to the south of the bridge. Um, they'll put two more poles temporarily out in the grassy areas in the interchange. Uh, when we're all done, those lines will come back up and be attached to the permanent poles. What you will see in the, also, um, what has to go up first before that temporary line runs, you'll see two 90-foot tall steel poles go where those foundations are. Those are permanent poles to span the lines back in their permanent location. When the bridge is all done, AEP comes back in and moves their lines back up to those poles that are right behind the sidewalk. So that's, that's what's underway and to come with utility relocations. Our, um, our next, next activity as a design team, getting this contract ready, comes at the end of June where the consultant and the city's engineers and um, engineering staff and designers, we all come together and go through a 90% complete set of plans and make sure the city is getting what we want out of the project. And that gives the consultant the, the direction and, and assurances they need to finalize the documents. The really important date we're all working towards uh, is what we call an advertisement date. That's where we release these documents to the contractors and tell them to give us a price, and that's August excuse me, September of this year, 
and over about a, a 20 to 30 day period, we give them that amount of time to read in detail and understand and pick apart these plans and put a price on the work. Um, the bid opening is when those sealed bids come in um, at a deadline one afternoon and we open them up and find out who is the low bidder. Um, so our game plan is to open those bids towards the end of September, get the contract signed in October and issue a letter telling the contractor to start work, which includes submitting paper to us first, um, requesting permission to use certain materials, certain subcontractors, giving us a schedule. And we'll sit down with the contractor towards the middle of October He'll tell us, he or she will tell us how they're going to build the project. And uh, late October, early November of 2017 is when we should see work beginning. Now one of the first things and the first impacts of traffic you will see is closing one lane of traffic in each direction on the expressway. This will be very similar to what we did when we replaced the retaining wall up at the top of the hill near Gray Street. We'll still have one lane open to traffic in each direction. But to safely remove the bridge, to provide room for the equipment, and most importantly, a safe working environment for the men and women who remove and replace this bridge doing the work out there, we have to put those barricades out and separate the traveling public from the construction equipment and, and workers. So you should see that towards the end of October, early November. And then the most important date, I think, to, to the community is November of 2018 is our fixed completion date for the project. Now to hold on just a minute. To um, the question was asked Thursday night, are we looking at incentives in the contract to encourage the contract? How are we going how are we going to meet that deadline? As engineers and contract managers, we can put uh, requirements in the contract that um, incentivize or disincentivize meeting certain in incremental milestones within a project. And we are evaluating four different options that uh, will be spread out through the life of the project that would encourage the contractor with financial incentive or disincentive to, uh, to meet certain critical deadlines during the duration of the project. And this is such an important project, we feel we need to include those in our contract. Go ahead. All of our projects have similar questions and I've tailored the answers to this project specifically. Um, first question, will the surrounding streets be closed to traffic? The project has a very small footprint. The, foot, the impacts on Main Street go back on the opposite side of the bridge in front of the first building, the, what I refer to as the Grand Furniture Warehouse, the gray warehouse that's right at the end of the bridge. On this side, it comes up um, to where the first and second buildings meet as you come, come across the bridge. That's, that's the Main Street footprint of the project. So um, access to local traffic will be maintained through the detours we uh, spoke about earlier and we can look at on the boards individually after the meeting. Um, the detours will be clearly signed to uh, provide the best direction we can to the traveling public. Um, Something that's very important, will emergency vehicles be able to get to homes? We know that property and lives depend on that. And yes, they will we'll be using the detours put in place. When we develop projects like this, um, as early as six or eight months ago, we make LENCOM and the agency, external agencies aware, look, this project's coming, we're gonna impact your routes. And um, early coordination with those external agencies is very important. In addition to going through LENCOM, I will typically send a written notice to both fire and police because since they are internal to the city, um, I don't think you can communicate your impacts too much to those agencies and you can't be early enough in, in making them aware of, of the impacts to their routes. One. Um, one impact to the expressway will be at night. This is a good time to talk about that when we talk about surrounding streets. Um, the new bridge will be about 101 feet long, and that's a single span of eight steel girders. 
So those, those steel girders will come in on special trucks, be hauled in at a time the contractor schedules, that he's got the foundations ready to lift those beams, turn them, and set them in place. Uh, that's a very large impact to expressway. We don't want to close the expressway um, in daytime, and uh, with limited ways to detour traffic around it, it's going to have to be nighttime work. I think it's far enough from the houses that it's not going to be a noise impact at night, no more than traffic going down the expressway. So um, we'll have a press release. I know um, two different contractors have built bridges across 460 in the last few months, and they have, they've had detours in place and put out advance notices through the press about lifting, lifting their beams and having the road closures at night. It'll be very similar to that, and we'll do the same for the community here. The contractor is typically responsible for, for finding the place to store their equipment. The question, where will equipment and materials be stored? It's going to take a lot of steel, reinforcing steel, and a lot of um, other parts and pieces to build this project. If they want to use private property, we don't stop them. We just ask that the contractor give us a document, documentation that they have the property owner's written permission. We don't get between the contractor and the property owner. That's private business and a private property and what deal they work out is between those two parties. We just um, expect them to respect the adjoining properties. Um, two other services that are important to the community are school buses and um, refuse truck access to your, to your streets. And those are two other entities, refuse and schools, that we communicate with early and they will have access using the detours put in place. And to go with the school buses, we've, we've also, as I mentioned earlier, we've talked to GLTC and they understand how to, how to work their 1A and 1B routes through the detours as well. So to keep you informed, I've got two other guests here tonight that will reach out to the business communities in different ways. Um, Ashley Kirshner was with the Downtown Lynchburg Association she'd wave. She works with the businesses downtown to communicate upcoming impacts and to hear their concerns about um, how public outreach might uh, mitigate the impacts of projects like this. I want to introduce her and thank her for coming tonight. Also Heather Kennedy is with the uh, downtown waterline and street, streetscape improvement project. She's the communications officer for that large project and she's working with us. Um, as a liaison between the two projects to make sure we understand where they are and how the projects coordinate. Um, as far as public meetings go, once we have a contractor in place and a, know of a schedule for his, his or her delivery of the project, we'll have another public meeting uh, to make everybody aware and look, we're getting ready to start work. This is how we intend to do the work. Uh, we'll use our local print and broadcast media as effectively as we can to keep you informed. Of course, the city website will have a site specific for this project and what you see in the detour maps printed behind you and in your, um, in your documents, those detour maps are available online. And they'll be linked through the city's um, Main Street Bridge replacement page. And if you, um, if you use social media, you're welcome to follow the city on Facebook or Twitter, either one. And with that, um, we'll go back one. I almost forgot to talk about the appearance. The last two slides show two different messages intentionally. This view of the bridge is as if you're coming across the river, headed southbound into the city as a whole. So our intent when we build the bridge is to use what we call a form liner. So when we pour the concrete, the the grooves that make it look like bricks, the grooves that set out the, uh, the black rectangle in the middle, and the shapes that make the letters will all be cast in the concrete at once as we pour the wet concrete into the forms and build the bridge. The contractor will pull those forms off and that physical, um, those shapes will be there, that physical improvement will be there. So after all the concrete is poured and the forms are all off, a specialty contractor will have to come in and colorize the entire bridge to the color scheme that we're presenting. Okay, Sheree. 
if you're headed northbound coming from Kemper and Gray Street to go downtown, um, downtown Lynchburg will be the message that we place on the bridge to show it as a gateway to downtown. Um, the hand railings that we're showing in this picture and we intend to use on this bridge are the same railings we have on the Kemper Street Bridge. And what we want to do as a city is use the same design consistently, both for aesthetics but also for, for maintenance. Um, have one product in inventory or one product that you can take to a vendor and consistently use for maintenance purposes if you need to. And that's, that's the extent of my presentation tonight. I want to thank you for coming out. And uh, are you going to walk the mic? We'll walk around with the mic since we record these meetings so everybody else can get the answers to the questions. We'll ask, just please raise your hand and we'll pass you the mic so we can get your question, if there are any. Um, will there be any vehicle size restrictions in your detour routes? What's your width? Did you catch that, Randy? Are there going to be any size restrictions for overwidth vehicles or certain width vehicles in the Route 29 detour or any of the side streets? Well, the uh, overwidth detour, the, when we do a lane closure on the expressway, we're going to leave I'm have a 14 foot clear roadway. So that way I got to uh, sign my overwidth detour on the expressway itself. Now, as far as overwidth through the city, it depends on where the streets are capable it, width wise. That, that'll be something we have to look at in the next few weeks. To, if, standard type of trailer would have no issue. The Kemper, with Kemper being completely rebuilt and 12th Street being repaved in the last year or two, that's where we're going to direct trucks, and we, we're confident Kemper and 12th will handle that. Thank you. Any other questions for the group as a whole? Side. The, the question is how long will the expressway be reduced to one lane in each direction? I'd say for the majority of, of the project. If we, um, it's, it's safe to say for the majority of the project. The, uh, the last work we do on the expressway will be to pull up those barricades and repave if the, if the pavement gets damaged and that's going to come towards the end of the project. If you'd like to ask something individually and not, uh, not out in front of everybody, I'll be around for a little bit. I'd be glad to look at the detours with you, Randy, or um, myself can talk to you about the detours. Again, thanks to the church for hosting, giving us a place to have this community meeting, and uh, hope you have a great evening. Thank you. <laughs>